singing. I left my mic on after prayer request. So, so I apologize now. I'm glad you're still here if you heard me. Phil's back here laughing, so I'm not worried. Phil can't hear me down there. <laughs> so anyway, it is good to be here with you this morning. And let me tell you something. Some of you probably walked in here, or some of you listened online, or maybe listened to later, you're probably going, this hasn't been a good morning. It's been a long, tough week. Can I get an amen that anybody's had a long, tough week this week, probably? Richard, why are you going yet? I mean, you're usually the one that causes the long, hard week for Lee. Lee's like, amen, somebody finally sees it. So anyway, well, I just want to say, if it has been one of those weeks, and if it hasn't, welcome, because you've come to the right place today as we wrap up our series out of the book of Jude called Fight for Faith, and we come today to this glorious conclusion with one of my favorite promises in all of Scripture. So I'm going to get there. But first, what I need to do, because we've been doing this since about May, I'm going to spend a little time in review, because where Jude started from the first of the book, where I started, we need to be completely, I want to be completely understanding of where we've come from in this book because it's so important for where we end at today. So we started this series by saying that fighting and continuing for the faith, the gospel, the truth of God, it begins with seeing first and foremost His glory and His majesty and seeing who He is. It all begins with God. It all ends with God. And until we see who God is, we never will want to fight. And contend for the faith. And that's where it begins. Then, second, we got to see the work of God. What He has done. What He is doing. And what He is going to do through His promises. And then third, fighting and contending begins with this. We must remember, most importantly, who God says that we are in Christ. That we are called by the Holy Spirit. That we are beloved by the Father. We are kept by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that we are abundantly blessed by the Holy Trinity. And once we see that, then fighting for the faith and contending for the faith is the only thing that makes sense. Because we see that He is worthy of all praise and glory and honor. And we see how urgent His message and His mess mission actually is. And that there's no greater reason than to fight and contend other than the name of Jesus Christ. And this fight begins in our personal lives. It begins in our families. It begins within the church that Jesus Christ died for. And we fight by abiding in the truth. The one that came and shed his blood for us in Jesus Christ. We abide in him. And we abide. We also fight by devouring his truth and knowing what his truth says. And by guarding his truth. By teaching it. By living it out. And walking alongside others. In this walk. And when we're doing this and we're fighting and contending, listen to me. I spent a whole week on this one subject. We can never be apathetic towards God's truth, towards the mission that Jesus Christ left for us, and we can never be apathetic towards those out there that turn their back to the truth and deny the truth. Apathy cannot cause the believer to lose their salvation, but apathy can cause the believer to miss out. On the promised blessings from God. Apathy can cause the believer to miss out on their specific calling from God. And apathy will hurt and cripple your witness, my witness, and the witness of the church. And to fight apathy, we've got to guard our hearts and minds. We've got to guard each other's hearts and minds. And we must give others an example to follow. And we can never, ever, ever forget our unapathetic God. Even when we are apathetic towards Him and His Word, He wasn't apathetic towards us because He sent the Son and He died on the cross. And in all of this, we have to watch out for those apostates. Those that turn their backs to the truth. Those that deny the truth. And these apostates, what they're trying to do is they're trying to draw your worship, you're trying to draw my worship away from the one true God. They're trying to get us to rely on our own strength and our own abilities. And if they do those two things, then these apostates, they can neutralize the working power of the believer and the church today. And these apostates, they tend to creep into the church unnoticed. They lie underneath the surface unnoticed. They creep in. 
Their words, they have no life in them. They produce no fruit. They bring nothing but division, chaos, and confusion. And they are nothing but fake, look-alike Christians that are always moving away from the light. Apostates are one of those traps, one of those snares that Satan sets for believers to bring destruction in the believer's life and in the life of the church. And we must always be on guard against that. And all of that today, it brings us to the last six verses, Jude 20 through 25, here in the Epistle of Jude. And it brings us to the two questions that we need to answer, and I think we find the glorious answer here in these verses right here. The first question is this, how do we remain faithful while we fight the, fight the faith, fight for the faith? And how is God faithful while we fight for the faith? So if you would, please stand as we read these six verses, beginning in verse 20 out of the book of Jude, to both answer both of those questions this morning. Jude says this, But you, beloved, building yourself up on, the most, on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some, have compassion, making a distinction. But others, saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today for meeting here with us and being here with us today. Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit be here in a mighty, powerful way. Open our hearts and open our minds so that we can hear wonderful things from your word. We love you and we thank you. We praise and honor you. We ask all this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <coughs> Let's start off with the first question. And the title today is very simple. The fight is difficult, but God is able. And since the fight is difficult, the question is, how do we remain faithful while fighting for the faith? I want to begin by saying this to you this morning. I never, ever want to leave anybody with the impression that fighting for the faith is easy. Because it's not. It's difficult. Fighting for the faith is fought with many tears, with much sorrow, and with plenty of hardships. But the fight is well worth it because we see the one that we are fighting for. And Jude here, he gives us three practical things to do so that we can remain faithful in our walk. While we do one of the most difficult things that we could ever do. Which is winning souls to Jesus Christ. And if you've ever been on the front line, you've been out there talking to people, you know that one thing that's probably the hardest thing to do is to deal with people and fight for the faith and witness to them to bring them to Jesus Christ. It is difficult. So Jude said here says, gives us three things. Number one, in verse 20, Jude says, Be informed. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith and praying in the spirit. Listen, brothers and sisters, how many of you have not heard this yet today or ever in your lifetime? How do you stay informed? By building yourself up in God's truth. Is there any Christian in here today that goes, I've never heard that? Exactly, that's my point. We've all heard that. Build yourself up in God's truth. Devour His Word. Paul tells Timothy this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Listen, brothers and sisters, how foolish we must be to think that we can stand and fight without first consulting the owner's manual. 
But my question today is, how many Christians try to go and fight and contend for the faith without consulting God's Word? It happens all the time. And listen to me. If you don't have a reading plan, then get one. If you don't know where to begin, then open your Bible, pick a book of the Bible, and begin reading. I don't recommend that you start off with Leviticus. Amen? I do recommend maybe the Gospel of John, or one of the Gospels, or one of Paul's epistles. But open up and start somewhere. If you got questions, listen, how many people have got questions and don't completely understand the Bible in here? Thank you. Most of you, all of your hands should be up because I still have questions at times. If you have questions and you don't understand, then what should you do? Ask. Get involved with a small group. Get involved with a group of guys or women that are serious about God's word and seeking his truth. Get involved. And how are you built up in the faith so that you can fight? You devour God's word. But listen, by praying in and through the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in, in John 16, he says, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he, the Holy Spirit, will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, Jesus says. And he will take uh, of what is mine, and listen to this, he will declare it to you, the Holy Spirit will take what is of Jesus, and he's going to declare it to you. Again, i got to say it, how foolish we must be to think that any growth and any learning that will ever happen to take place in any of our lives will happen apart from God himself, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And many people ask when it comes to prayer, just like they do scripture, where do I begin? Again, I tell you, when you're praying, open God's word, read God's word. You ready for this? Then pray about what you just read. Pray about God's word. And you know, when I first started reading his word and praying years and years ago, you know how long I could stay in the word and read and pray? Five minutes was a great start for me. Five minutes. And grow from there. But you got to start somewhere. You don't know how to pray. Then brothers and sisters, we're not called to live this life by ourselves. If you don't know how to pray, get around other men and women and pray with them. And learn how to pray and hear how they pray and see what they pray for. But get around each other and let's pray. Listen. The whole point of me saying this and being being informed and praying is very simple. If you never begin, then you will never grow. And if you're never growing, brothers and sisters, if you're never growing, if you're not devouring his word and praying, then you will be walking into a fight uninformed. And if you're walking into the fight with the devil, you will lose. You've got to be informed. And then after you're informed, I love this one. Be insulated. Verse 21. Jude says this. I love it. Keep yourself in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal life. Keep yourself. Remain. Stay. Be insulated in the love of God. In other words, as Jesus says in John 15, 5, I am divine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. How foolish we must be to think we can stand and fight without first abiding in the one who has already conquered our greatest enemy, death. The one that has overcome the grave. How foolish we must be if we don't first abide in Jesus Christ. And this is where so many people go wrong in the church today. They come to Jesus Christ. Or they just leave from a conference or a summer camp. And they are pumped up. They're excited. They're on fire to set the world on fire for Jesus Christ. And that's a good thing. But all their excitement, you know what they do? They start doing. They start doing things and doing things and doing things. And they forget. I've done this before. They forget that doing things first begins with abiding in 
of Jesus Christ. You see, what happens is they jump to the Great Commission of Matthew 28, and that's a great thing. We need to be doing the Great Commission of Matthew 28, but we can never, ever, ever skip over John 15, 5. See, we can never do until we first abide. You see what's going on here? Because if you start doing without abiding in Jesus Christ, your works will not stand. We've got to first abide in His love. It comes first. First and foremost, insulate yourself in the love of God by abiding. And then listen to me here closely, brothers and sisters. God's provided another way for us to be insulated. You know what it is? You and me. It's the body of Christ. It's the church. Listen. God has, has supplied us with the body of Christ to insulate us from those that are going to be attacking. And believe me, if you haven't watched the news, they're coming for us. Surround yourself with other brothers and sisters to walk with you, pray with you, and hold you accountable. The one thing I see in Scripture from beginning to the end is this. God's people are a people that gather and come together. And I don't just mean on Sunday mornings to listen to a preacher and hear some music. I mean people get together throughout the week. They call each other. They have meals together. They sit down and have coffee together. They get together. They study God's word. They tell each other what's going on in each other's life. And they insulate each other. That's the great part about the church. The church is God's design to insulate you in his love. And anybody out there that says, I don't need to be in the church to be a Christian, you're lying and deceiving yourself. God's people got to gather together called the body of Christ, called the church. Because that's one of the ways that God has designed to keep us insulated in the love of God. Be informed. Be insulated. And then Jude says third in verses 22 and 23, be involved. Now we have to look at the context of Jude 22 and 23. And Jude is not here in these two verses. He's not saying to volunteer and do things in the church, even though that is part of being involved. Jude is something, saying something that is much greater and much more difficult than just doing things around the church. You know what he's saying here? In verse 22 and 23, Jude is telling us to get involved with people. Get involved with the life of others. And the reason he's saying this, brothers and sisters, is this. It's because it's the people that make up the body of Christ. It's the people that need the truth. It's the people that are hurting and struggling. It's the people that are lost and dying without Jesus Christ. So get involved in the life of others. That's what verse 22 and 23 he's saying. Get involved in their lives. I don't know about you. Getting involved in the lives of others. That's dirty and messy. And sometimes, it's very difficult. It's hurtful. It's painful. Brothers and sisters, that's what Jesus Christ, that's what Jude is saying here. Get involved in the life of others. He's saying, have mercy on those that doubt. Snatch those that are wandering or lost out of the fire. Love people because they are created in the image of God, but despise the sin that is leading to their destruction. See them as God sees them, as people that the Son, Jesus Christ, came to die for. And remember, when we get involved with people, we've got to remember what God loves the most. And God loves people. Amen? He loves people. And listen to me. He even loved you enough to get involved in your life to pull you from the grave that He found you in. And brothers and sisters, if He can save me, if he can save you, he can save the addict, he can save the prostitute, he can save the atheist, and he can save the person that he <coughs> placed in front of you in your life. One of the hardest things to do, and somebody tell me if I can get an amen on this one, one of the hardest things to do is show mercy, grace, and compassion on those that have no mercy, grace, and compassion in them, right? 
Let's be honest in our little sick, twisted hearts. I'm out on the road and somebody cuts me off or does something. What's the first thing we want to happen? I hope a cop saw that. I hope a cop saw that. I hope they get what's coming to them. One of the hardest things to do is show mercy, grace, and compassion on those that don't have it. But that's exactly what God did for you and me. Because before you came to Jesus Christ, you were not full of mercy, grace, or compassion. You were not full of love. But still, that's what he did for you and me. And that's what he wants to do for them. So get involved in the lives of others inside and outside the church. Disciple new believers. Disciple our next generations. Walk alongside of brothers and sisters in Christ. Go have coffee. With that non-believer that God has placed in your way. Ask that single mom or dad what you can do to help. Sit down and listen to that divorcee. Get involved in the life of others. Because brothers and sisters, that's where real discipleship begins. Getting involved in the life of others. <coughs> Be insulated by the love of God and be involved in the life of others. Quick question. Is there anybody in here that has not heard that before? Exactly. Now I know that there are those people in here sitting in here today. And I know there are those people online that are listening today and they say, oh, here we go again. It's the same thing. Read your Bible, pray, come to church, be around God's people, help and volunteer within the church, witness, within, witness to others. And I know that there are people sitting in here today, and I know there are people listening out there today that are thinking that to themselves today. Question. Has anyone ever had to turn to your kids and say to them, how many times have I got to tell you? I shouldn't have to tell you over and over again. If you would do what I already told you, we wouldn't have this issue right now, and you're irritated, and you're frustrated. Garrett, you've never heard me say that before, have you? Yeah, right. <laughs> Anyone in here ever had to do that to your kids or your grandkids? <coughs> oh, come on, nobody? I know I see some head shaking. Yeah, we all have. And please, I'm not asking if you have to do that with your wife or your husband. I don't want to know that answer. I'm not doing marriage counseling today. that. <laughs> Have you ever had to repeat yourself to your kids or your grandkids? Can I tell you a little secret this morning? It breaks the heart of God when he has to tell his children over and over again what they should be doing. And his children always end up in the same places that he found them in because his children are not doing what he's already told them to do. You know what I'm saying? In other words, I'm saying... When you complain about your kids not listening, you do the same thing to our Heavenly Father. That's why I have to repeat it. Listen to me. Listen to me closely. You read through Scripture. The greatest testimony that a Christian could ever read is a life that is marked by obedience to his Heavenly Father. Isn't that what you want out of your kids and grandkids? Trust me. Obey me. That's what God wants from us. So brothers and sisters, and I preach this to myself, when I have to repeat myself about being informed, being insulated, and being involved, I have to remind myself, and there are preachers around the world today that are having to remind their congregations too. Because we all need that reminder that sometimes we're just a bunch of stubborn, hard-headed kids. Amen? Be informed by his word. Be insulated by the love of God and be involved in the lives of others within the church and outside the church. That is God's way of helping us remain faithful while we fight and contend for the faith. And then we come to our second question today. And the second question is this. How is God faithful while we fight and contend for the faith? I just want to warn you real quick. I'm getting ready to get really excited. Richard's like, oh, no. 
I'm getting ready to get really excited because I told you, the glorious ending of this book, this letter from Jude, I'm getting ready to get really excited. Look again there at verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Oh, man. First, glorious promise. God is able to keep you. Listen to me. It doesn't say God but was able to keep you in the past. It doesn't say that God will be able to keep you in the future. It says God in the present tense, Greek, English, any language that you want to read, God is able to keep you. Whether you pick up his word, picked, it, picked up this letter 2,000 years ago, or whether you pick up this letter 2,000 years from now, or whether you pick it up right now, the word is still going to read the same thing. It's going to say, is God is able to keep you. And brothers and sisters, the half-brother of Jesus, Jude, he's sitting here talking about fighting and contending the hardest thing that we could ever do. Getting involved in the lives of others. And he's saying, at the end of this, here's your encouragement. Brothers and sisters, the God that died for you is the same God that's going to bring you home. And he can make that promise because he is able. When you understand that the same God who saved you is the same God that will sustain you all the way home, you're never going to stop shouting and praising His name, and you never want to stop fighting for His truth. This truth is the truth that we should be teaching our next generations and new believers, and because once you get this truth, the floodgates of His power that lives inside of each and every believer, it opens wide up. Because God is able. Or as Paul says in Philippians 1.6, Paul says that he is certain that he who began the good work in you will be able to complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. Listen. How can I give it up and follow him when the road is difficult? Because he is able. How can I have the courage to speak his truth when I know persecution will come? Because he is able. How can I do something I could never do on my own? Because he is able. How can I do nothing? How, how do I know that nothing can ever separate me from the love of Christ? Because Jesus Christ is able. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. If it were up to me, to keep my salvation, I would blow it every time. But God is able. And God takes full responsibility for bringing you home. Listen. And there are people I've talked to. I've had this question before in my life a long time ago. There are those people that think, I've done enough to blow it. Or if I do this, if I can lose my salvation, I can blow it. Listen, if you belong, you can never blow it. But if you can blow it, then let me tell you something. You didn't belong in the first place. If you can blow it, you never belonged in the first place. Listen to what Jesus says in John 10. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they will follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And listen, no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. Question. For those of you that think that you might be able to blow it here or listen online, question, are you a someone? Jesus said no one, including you, can lose your salvation. Amen? There's nothing you can do 
to blow the grace and mercy that Jesus Christ has already given us. And he's going to keep on. And as I said Wednesday night, we might get off the path and wander a little bit. Have you ever thought about how we sing about wandering? Come thou found. It says, O oh, to grace, how great a death. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts. Brothers and sisters, every single one of us, me included, we all have a tendency to wander. We sing about it. And listen, as I said Wednesday night, we tend to wander. When we start wandering off the course, what, is, what, what does God do? He nudges us back on. And when we don't listen, and we don't listen, and we don't listen, what does God do? He's going to do whatever it takes to bring you back on the path of life. You can't lose your salvation because God loves you that much. And as I said Wednesday night, that's how valuable you are to Jesus Christ. There is nothing you can do, and He is going to bring you back on the course. First thing that God does is it keeps us on course because God is able. And then number two. Oh, this is, this is awesome. Glorious truth number two. Jesus Christ will personally present you and me blameless to the Father and he will do it all with all joy. Can you imagine the day? And we're all looking forward to that day that we stand before him. Can you imagine the day now? Standing beside you is our Lord and Savior. And he's saying to the Father, Father, look at this one. I proudly present him to you. I present him perfect and blameless to you because of my blood that was shed for him. And there will be no debate. There will be no questions on that day. Because you have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. The God that is able to keep you through his blood that he shed for you is the same God. Listen to this. It's the same God that's going to present you holy and acceptable to God the Father on that day. Amen. The one that died for me, he's going to present me spotless, blameless, righteous, perfect, holy, and acceptable. And he's going to say, this one's mine. Father, I give them to you. Anybody else looking for forward to that day? And in that moment, when Jesus Christ presents me holy and acceptable, in that moment, the only thing that I will be able to say is how Jude ends this book. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power forever and forever. Amen. Is that not some awesome news today? Why do we fight and contend for the faith? Because Jesus Christ, His name and His glory is all that matters. And the same one that calls us to stand up and fight for his truth, the same one that died and shed his blood for us, he is the only one that is able to make this promise and guarantee. And we can't be apathetic towards who he is, towards his truth, and towards his mission. We must always be on guard for those wolves that dress up in sheep's clothing while we're sharing his great name and his glory. And we must always remember who we are fighting for. God is able. And on that day, He's going to present me, He's going to present you, and everybody else that is in Jesus Christ. He personally is going to present us to the Father. Can you get your head around that for a second? I can't. That just blows my mind. I can't get it. But that's our destiny. That's what we look forward to. That's what Titus, Paul says to Titus. That is our blessed hope. When he returns, he's going to present us 
Oh man, brothers and sisters. In light of all this, in light of all the things that Jude said, fighting for the faith, yes, it is difficult, but fighting and contending for the faith is all that matters because of who he is, because of what he has done and what he's going to do. So I say today as we close out the book of Jude, to God be the glory, to God be all praise, because God is able. His name is Jesus Christ, and he is worthy of fighting for. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. And Father, you've told us through many different ways, through your word, through the Son, through the Holy Spirit, you have told us this walk is not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. And Father, I just pray today that, that, that you put it deep in our hearts, put it in our minds, and remind us that no matter what comes up, we have brothers and sisters to walk with us, to insulate us in your love. We have your word to keep us informed. There are others out there that need us to be involved in their lives because they're walking down paths of destruction. But Father, I just pray today that you remind us every step of the way that since you called us, you're the God that is able to carry us all the way home. And on that day, remind us each and every day as we're fighting for your truth that you are able and that one day that beloved son that shed his blood for each and every single one of us. He's the one that gets to present us righteous, holy, blameless, and acceptable before you. Father, let your glory shine out there in the world. Give us the strength that we need. Give us the words and the gentleness and the boldness that we need as we go out and magnify your name this week. We love you and we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.